Hi, and welcome to another edition of Lectures Around Town, exploring issues and making connections in environmental and global issues here in Minnesota, out on the Mississippi River, and around the globe. Over there, I am uh, back to talk about an issue that is um, kind of central to a lot of the political challenges and debates we have these days and environmental issues as well. I am here down by Minnehaha Creek. Um, in the Dakota language, that means the falling water, basically, and just downstream from here is the Minnehaha Falls one of the prettier spots in, in town. And, um, but what I wanted to talk about today, related to both Political Science 160 and ENV 100, is this issue of how much humans control about the world around them, how we exercise power and use our abilities, our technology, to shape the world around us to fit with our particular needs and, and wants. And the question of how much control is warranted, is there such a thing as trying to have too much control, uh, not enough control? Um, but this question about about control and power is, is really central to the human condition, right? Human beings have some ability to control the world around us. It's always limited. Um, we often wish we had more control. So we're getting to experience some of this contrast between controlled and uncontrolled environments uh, in in our class this this semester because meeting outside we already have have seen how it can it's kind of uncontrolled it's it's uncomfortable it can be noisy it can be windy um, and we're seeing pros and cons to that and uh, so this difference between what does it mean to be in a controlled space like a classroom that has lots of elements to it that are um, constructed to fit our needs, uh, data projectors and blackboards or whiteboards and seating and air conditioning and heating and lighting and all the rest. And now lots of air circulation and filters to try and keep out dangerous viruses and all that stuff. So. Um, so that, that setting has certain pros and cons. And then, of course, being outside has its pros and cons as well. And so this has brought to mind for me these, these trade-offs we have between what do we control and what don't we control and, and how do we make uh, sensible, uh, how do we make the best kinds of choices around how much we can and can't control. As part of all that we're doing this semester, which is to engage with and to learn from the experiences we're going through, that's part of what I'm going to talk about here and what I hope we can discuss and, and reflect on in the, in the class because it relates to these bigger philosophical, political, environmental issues that we'll be grappling with. And we've, of course, been dealing with a lot of things these days that seem kind of out of control too. Um, the virus, obviously, Corona, COVID-19, being a prime example of something that's come along that's sort of out of control and we're doing our best to try to control it by social distancing and wearing masks and all of that stuff. And the political issues, the unrest, the protests, uh, the craziness coming out of DC, a lot of big things happening in the world that also kind of feel like we don't have much control over them. So I think we're all experiencing in various ways some of what it 
the the discomfort that comes with uh, not being in control and when things seem like they're spinning out of control to some degree so we're i think uh, particularly aware of some of those challenges right now So I've mentioned that the uh, some of the books we're reading, including *Sapiens* for you students in Paul 160, and also for those who are reading the Overstory book and uh, *Braden Sweetgrass* in EMV 100, we take a look at other cultures, other times, um, where again. Different people have experienced different levels of control. And Harari starts off his book by going, you know, back to early hunter-gatherer societies. And I want to just read you a, a little passage here that uh, I thought was relevant here. So he says, to understand our nature, history, and psychology, we must get inside the heads of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. For nearly the entire history of our species, Homo sapiens lived as foragers. The past 200 years, during which our ever-increasing numbers of sapiens have obtained their daily bread as urban laborers and office workers, and the preceding 10,000 years, during which most of, uh, of us lived as farmers and herders, are the blink of an eye compared to the tens of thousands of years during which our ancestors hunted and gathered. The flourishing field of evolutionary psychology argues that many of our present day social and psychological characteristics were shaped during this long pre-industrial era. Uh, so it's... Um, he says that in this environment, which gives us our current environment, which gives us more material resources and longer lives than those enjoyed by any previous generation, i.e. when we have so much more control over our environment, uh, it makes, we've enjoyed, yeah, we've enjoyed these resources, but it makes us feel alienated, depressed, and pressured to understand why, psychologists argue, we need to delve into the hunter-gatherer world that shaped us um, and the world that we subconsciously still inhabit. Uh, and that just is the beginning of uh, chapter 3 on page 40 there. And uh, so this made me think about the fact that really for almost all of human history, We've lived in this uh, way in which we have had to adapt to the world and have had very little control over it. Um, and I want to give you an example of that from uh, a trip I took a few years ago. This issue of control came up in a really interesting way during a trip I took to Tanzania back in 2013. And here's a group of some of us at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro after we, we summited it. So that was kind of cool and exciting. And uh, one of the things we did after we got there was uh, go visit with a, a small group of people who are part of the Hadzabe community. They uh, are some of the few remaining hunter-gatherer people in, in Africa in this area of the bush country in Tanzania, and that was their home there, just living out in the wilds. And they invited us in and through translation uh, showed us a little bit about how they, they live here, actually making fire by, you know, rubbing two sticks together. And um, they actually then the next morning took us out hunting and uh, in the bush country and here's one of the poor creatures that they caught this is how they do it this was a arrow that shot through this uh, bush baby and they got three of them uh, so sorry for the gruesome picture but that's uh, that's how they live and that's what they eat 
uh, along with gathering honey and, um, you know, literally, you know, nuts and berries. And they obviously live with almost none of the contemporary technologies that we have. This was cooking breakfast here. This was their little fire, and they would just put the entire animal in there and and uh, cook it and eat it. And so that was what we 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 shared a little bit of that with them that day. And so for them, clearly, uh, they are um, living on terms dictated by the natural world and they do not control much about what happens around them and so this contrast between hunter-gatherers pre-agricultural people and how they interact with the world stands in obvious stark contrast to the way we live in our world today with so much that we control and uh and we have such a huge impact on the world. These guys would do a little hunting and kill some animals to eat, but uh, uh, that was about it. This question of control is an interesting one. Uh, because on one level, of course, we, we want to have more control over things in our life. We don't want to be cold or hot. We want to be comfortable. We don't want to be able to get the things we want in life, all those, the varied splendors of what it is that humans like to do. But there's always, uh, almost always, a cost that goes with that control, to control things we have to manipulate the world. We have to use energy. We, we tinker with the universe. We tinker with the environment. And none of that is without some kind of downside. And I think that's part of what we're having to struggle with here is we're getting better and better at controlling the world. We're getting more and more technology and more energy and ways to do this. Um, and as a result, we're then living in a world that is more and more altered by human activity, by policies, by technologies, by infrastructures, all of these things. And we're having to figure out how much control we can really live with or what is the right balance between control and letting go. So this issue of control manifests in countless ways around us, obviously. Uh, I'm looking here at some lawn, right? That's a, a kind of controlled environment that we have cultivated and has become a huge part of, of human lived spaces is, is this lawn where we take uh, a little bit of nature, a little bit of grass, and we uh, plant that and cultivate it, keep all the other weeds out, right? So weeding or putting herbicides as a way to control nature. So, you know, just over here, we have, you know, uncontrolled nature. So we have all sorts of what we might call weeds and the woods and the wildness. And then we have right, grass, very uniform. And, it, and it's something that fits with our needs, right? It's easy to walk on. It's kind of clean. It's, it has this uh, aesthetics, right? A certain sensibility that um, is uniform. Uh, and and we like it a lot. We plant it everywhere, and and at Augsburg and all over the place, people are constantly mowing and controlling nature that way, right? If I go over into the weeds here, there's lots of other things happening, <laughs> and it's interesting. It's diverse. There might be a lot more other life in there but it's harder to walk around and it, some people don't think it looks as nice 
and so we tend to limit that. Um, and obviously our houses, where we live, where we work, where we go to school usually is in buildings that are these constructed, built spaces that we control, right? So that there's a even temperature, we like that. There's uh, a certain light level. It's not too dark, not too bright. Um, it's comfortable, right? Comfortable, it conforms to human wishes and desires. Uh, there might be seating, like this bench here, right? Here's a, a very basic human form that relates to our particular bodily needs. We get uncomfortable if we're standing for too long. We, and if we're on the ground, it might be wet or dirty, but chairs and benches are another form of human modification. Very, very simple, simple and and low impact, um, but just one of countless examples. So another form of control is transportation. Maybe you can see this plane flying off. It's uh, yeah, a little hard to zoom in on that, but and obviously one of the primary uh, forms of control we have is in the automobile or in this case you see a car here that's like a little travel van that it's its own little bubble in which you can move very quickly and easily and you have probably they've probably got a little bed or something in there and it's all very comfy and cozy right um, so obviously automobiles is a huge, huge part of the technology we use to control the world around us. And we have created this vast infrastructure of paved surfaces, roads that are paved with concrete or tar, blacktop. That's called black tar macadam after this Scottish guy who first came up with this formula for, for blacktop. And so that is a technology that works well for humans who like to move. One of the things that we want to need is to move around the world quickly and efficiently. That's part of what we like. So there are a lot of things in nature that we can't control pretty much. So I like the sun up there, I won't look right at it, but uh, that's something that just is going to do its thing and we pretty much can't control that. We can maybe try to avoid it, we can get out of the sun, but the sun does its thing and it's so much bigger than us that it is something that is not in our control and uh, is obviously a huge resource. What we can try to control is how we use the energy uh, that the sun emits and that powers everything on earth, including, you know, all these trees and pretty much everything else with the exception of a little bit of geothermal power and gravity and stuff, but pretty much everything else is solar powered. So it's just kind of there and um, we can't control its production, but we can control how we harvest it and use it. And there's the air all around us, right? Which is produced by all this green stuff, the oxygen is, and, um, and the wind that blows, we can't really control that, can't control where the wind is going. You learn that when you're sailing, where you have to work with the wind. Um, so, and water is another thing. It's a, kind of in this interesting category because in many ways you can't control this. So here, this bit of Minnehaha Creek right now, very placid, hardly any flow, just a little bit of water um, passing by. And um, 
but a lot of times it will flood um, or sometimes it runs dry if we're in the middle of a drought and so humans try to control the flow of water and since water is such a vital natural resource that's something where we have this this tension between control or lack of control is is readily apparent is in that context of of, of water uh, particularly in rivers and we've done a huge amount to try and control rivers in the last couple centuries particularly the last hundred years with the construction of a huge number of dams and other flood control projects and irrigation projects and so on. Um, and those again come with costs and benefits um, to them that we need to, to think about. One of the other uh, areas of our life where there's actually a whole new kind of arena of trying to create environments is obviously the digital realm. That's part of what I'm doing here. It's part of what we are all doing during COVID is going from the quote unquote real world into this digital realm where to some degree, obviously we can control a lot more. Um, and then there's other issues that arise as well. But it is interesting to think about how all of this, this whole digital revolution we're in is about, cre in, in many regards, about creating artificial environments. When you think about, you know, the, all of these artificial worlds that, that are created in the gaming realm, in SimCity and all of these other, you know, uh, you know, sort of artificial worlds that begin to look more and more realistic, uh, more and more immersive. Uh, we're spending more and more time on it. Uh, you're watching a digital version of me right now <clears throat> without fear of catching COVID, um, without having to perhaps step outside. And <clears throat> this raises, I think, a whole nother set of interesting issues around how much we control and how how much that's part of what we do as humans is try to create these environments and that conform to our particular needs. And um, again, the question is, what are the costs and benefits of creating that, um, both psychologically for ourselves, how is that affecting us personally, psychologically, to be spending so much time online? And we talked a little bit about how it, it seems to be taking a toll. Um, it has, again, upside and downside to it. Um, and then what does it mean that we're, we're more and more disconnected from the real world because we're spending so much time staring at screens? Um, and so I think uh, what I want to show you next is just a little uh, table that you can think about filling in pros and cons of these more controlled and less controlled environments and how we begin to think about the trade-offs there and what would we see as the optimal balance or the best way to, to um, live in the world with, um, as human beings with limited abilities to control the world, but uh, some need to do, uh, uh, you know, control it some, but not too much. So for our class discussion, I, I'd like uh, you all to think about this uh, little two-by-two two table here that lists, uh, asks you to list some of the pros and cons of being uh, in different kinds of environments, in our case, whether it's being inside or outside, and in a situation where there is more control, but uh, more sort of isolation, if you will, versus less control and more exposure and more direct experience. And that's, uh, I think it's, it's worth thinking about those, those pros and cons and, and what you see as really valuable, where you'd like to draw the line between the two when it comes to all sorts of issues whether it's environmental issues or issues around public safety or issues um, around how much uh, we build walls around a country. Um, so lots of different um, political and environmental issues where this question of power and control come up.